I think it's really important in a session like this to um, remember that behind the statistics there are stories and heartache. Um, it's quite easy for us day to day to be dealing with our business and sometimes to forget that. The statistics we produce now, um, more and more are the responsibility of the Office of National Statistics, which I think is really, really, really helpful to us because it gives us all across the system um, great, greater credibility. But the reality is that, for example, the Home Office gave a figure out just recently that a stabbing costs effectively £300,000, um, a homicide about one and a half million. Uh, that's probably not all the costs, but the sort of order of costs involved in crime. And of course, that is nothing compared to the impact on the victim and their families and the communities when horrific things happen. So we've always got to remember um, that that's really what it's about. And painfully for us, in the last um, few weeks, within one week in youth justice, two young people uh, have died in custody. A very rare event, nevertheless, a terrible event which can't be tolerated. So all these things are what youth justice, in a sense, is about. It's about a lot more than the structures and a lot more than the statistics. So what I want to do um, is to quickly look at... Uh, I'm aware that most of you are not over-familiar with the youth justice system, although many of you will have had a lot of dealings with youth offending teams. But the complexity of the system is there. All criminal justice arrangements are complex, inevitably. Uh, they, they involve partnerships. But in youth justice, extra complexity by the fact that we have 158 youth offending teams, as well as the other array of agencies with which you're all familiar. Because local authorities, of course, have a very specific responsibility for every child, uh, every young person, under the age of 18. And so we have to find ways of joining all that. One of the very encouraging things is that following the 1998 Crime and Disorder Act, when youth offending teams were set up as multi-agency partnerships, they have been deemed very successful. And the government coming in in 2010 was very willing to say, endorse the model, and say that that has been the way to work and carry on working like that. And that's very, very encouraging because actually those teams and the way they have worked have been a very good example to other developments um, in localities, which, which you'll be very well, well up. Because you can't deliver anything. You can't deliver anything successfully unless you do it in partnership. And also the Youth Justice Board has had the role of overseeing the arrangements between custody and community um, and working with local authorities and the, all the key stakeholders, especially groups like ACPO, Magistrates Association, very key part of our role is to bring those really important agencies together so that we can make progress um, bit by bit, working out which the issues are, what are the solutions, who has to be involved in progressing those solutions. So you see our responsibilities um, are there clearly laid out. Um, and during the time that the new youth justice system, not so new now, but you know, relatively new, I suppose, youth justice system has been operating, there have been some very significant achievements. And we're very proud of this. And I think, of course, the um, credit goes to those working on the ground day in, day out with young people. Um, and there has been a very dramatic reduction in the number of first-time entrants into the youth justice system. And of course, that's had a huge knock-on effect because it's meant that the resources we spend have been able to be applied to the young people who are causing the greatest level of trouble in their communities and causing the most damage and, and the most um, harm to victims. Uh, there's also been a very significant reduction in the frequency with which young people offend. And that is really important because uh, it's important important that there's a, the reoffending rate goes down, that's the do they reoffend or don't they reoffend rate, but also the number of crimes that a young person commits is really important because if you're on the receiving end of a crime, you're bothered about how many there are. So there's been a very major reduction there and as a result of a huge amount of effort in terms of focusing on why young people are going into custody when they could have had an appropriate community sentence. There's been a, a, almost a third reduction in the numbers, and that's at a time when the adult population in prison has been going up and up um, very significantly. So one of the most significant changes has been the number of under-15s in custody has gone down by half in the last three years. And as a result of that, we've been able to decommission over 1,000 places in custody, and that saved an enormous amount of money. But of course, it's not just about money. That is, of course, really important, but it means we're not having young people in custody, which is not a good place for young people if they don't absolutely need to be there. Having said that, so big achievements, but as you'd expect me to say, huge amounts still to do because the reoffending rate is still far too high 
high. The overall reoffending rate for young people is about 33%, about a third overall. But at the more serious end, young people leaving custody, you're talking about 70%. So 70% of young people leaving custody go on to reoffend. Far, far too high. Um, and a lot obviously needs to be done about it. So that's a really big issue. The other issues I want to quickly um, give you a flavour of what we're doing. We have to keep focusing on prevention. We've got to stop young people offending in the first place. Obvious, of course, not so easy to do. And um, it's getting harder and harder. Serious youth violence, day in, day out, we hear of particularly in our cities of serious youth crime which is a huge concern to, uh, because of the fate of those young people and because of the communities that they're damaging and we've got to carry on improving the um, secure estate which young people in custody are placed in and finally we've got to consider the changes coming up as Baroness Harris mentioned police and crime commissioners actually think are a, a very fundamental change but have to be turned into an opportunity uh, for a youth justice and we intend to do that uh, I'm not going to say anything today about post 18 what happens to young people and then transfer between youth justice and probation but I've noticed from the delegate list that a lot of you here are from probation so if anyone would like to talk with me about that over the break, I'd be happy to do that because it's a bit of an obsession of mine that we need to be working much um, more um, effectively together to, to assist that transition. So, very quickly, what's happening on the rehabilitation revolution? Well, um, the government is very uh, determined that we will make more difference in terms of stopping uh, young people offending. And there's three strands to this, really, very strongly in youth justice. First of all, incentivising local authorities who are responsible for the young people in their area to make sure that they do not end up in custody, and they absolutely have to. And there's some key, um, there's some key rec um, new... Um, provisions in the uh, Legal Aid and Sentencing Punishment of Offenders Bill, um, which will create a new remand arrangements for young people, and which will pass the costs of that remand to uh, the local authority from the area where the young person comes from. Now, it's a really important change. It's taken quite a while up with us working for local with local authorities to get them to um, recognise that that is a right move. You can understand the resistance there might be to that. Um, and that's, that's going well. There will also obviously have to be a transfer of funding for that. But the other thing is, which is pretty fundamental, is to designate young people leaving custody, sorry, in, uh, young people remanded in custody uh, as looked after children. And that's a, another very significant change, which will increase massively the focus on those young people. And we've also introduced a payment by results scheme, working with the Ministry of Justice, which um, pathfinder schemes, where groups of local authorities have got together and we are giving them upfront uh, money to invest in improving the services, which will result in a reduction in the number of young people going in custody. So services which support young people, which enable them to be accommodated, which support family therapy, those sorts of services. And it's very early days on that to see what the outcome will be. But the intention is that over the two-year period, that would reduce the numbers in custody by 60. Now, that might not sound a lot, but that saves around uh, £4.8 million pounds a, uh, a year. Uh, and yet the investment we're putting in is about that same amount, but only uh, over the period. So it's it's, it's, it isn't just about money, it's about children, it's about uh, reducing the number of victims, but it does also potentially save a lot of money. The second strand of re rehabilitation revolution that we are really very strongly focused on is improving resettlement. There's been an awful lot of work going on on that. Everyone in this room understands how important resettlement is. But for young people, it's just utterly crucial. If they come out of custody and have nowhere to go, no school to go back to, no training place, no job, and no personal support, because the children we're talking about do not have almost never have the families that are there to pick up the pieces, support them when going gets tough, always keeping an eye out for them, helping them find their way. They don't exist, but very rarely exist. And that's what we have to replicate in some way, and it's extremely challenging. So we've been working together, joining, twinning, really, uh, young offender institutions with uh, groups of local authorities like Greater Manchester with Hindley and Wigan, um, South East local authorities with Cook and Wood Young Offender Institution and uh, Medway Secure Training Centre, which are on the same campus, uh, twinning them, really, to get them working very closely together with the third sector, with charities and 
groups like the Construction Youth Trust, which finds training opportunities for young people, uh, Catch-22, who provide accommodation, those sorts of... The Prince's Trust is involved in all of these, and it's beginning to show very encouraging results. And there's also been really important developments at the Heron Unit at Felton YOI as well. Um, so there's a lot going on, and this is absolutely essential that we keep going. A third aspect of the rehabilitation re revolution is restorative justice. I'm sure you'll probably hear more about this later today. The minister, Chris Blunt, is really committed to this. And there are, you know, they're not unending... Uh, endless amounts of money available to invest, but by investing wisely, and we're investing it in training our volunteers, who there's about 8,000 volunteers across the country who work on youth, youth fender panels, uh, on referral orders with young people. Uh, really good training for them in restorative practice, trying to extend the reach of restorative justice across the youth justice system. And that's only the start, but it was a very important start. And we think that that will start to make a difference because we all know that the victim satisfaction uh, with restorative justice is very good. And it's a really important part of the system that we have to develop. So moving on to prevention, we have to keep going on this reducing the number of young people who offend in the first place. I know it's obvious. We have spent a great deal of money over the last few years, but achieved a great deal by focusing on 8 to 13-year-olds. Now, a lot of that money now has gone into the early intervention grant, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, um, but it's not ring fence to that age group or particular activity. So youth offending teams have had to kind of go and get it and demonstrate their worth to, to, um, to the, 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 uh, the authority, authority they're working in um, to get that money and focus it on young people. But we're confident a lot of them have been able to do that. In some areas, though, prevention schemes have been closing, and that is a, a real cause for concern. So we've been looking for other sources of funding, working with the Big, Lo Big Lottery, which has got a really ambitious program in this area, um, working with the Department of Health, who've got a fantastic program of diversion, triage, really, uh, where young people are at point of arrest. They are dealt with by a health professional first, um, so that the question as to whether they're charged or whether they're referred to another service it's dealt with um, looking at their needs to start with, as well as, of course, the crime uh, or offence that they may have um, alleged to have committed. So that's a really important. And, of course, the Troubled Families Initiative, a really major government programme, obviously all contributes in this area towards prevention. But I think, you know, if we let up on this, we will be completely mad because we would effectively start to see the reversal of all the achievements that uh, have been made. On the other end of the system... We're really talking uh, very serious uh, youth violence, gangs. Uh, as you know, as a result of the riots, the government has focused very strongly on uh, what to do next on gangs. The cross-government uh, report ending uh, gang, gang and youth violence has a whole major programmes, uh, which affect not everywhere in the country so much, but certainly the, the key metropolitan areas in a big way. And it's very much focused on prevention, on punishment, um, under-18 gang injunctions, which is a completely new approach, um, involves civil uh, orders and uh, uh, requirements on young people uh, who are involved in gangs or um, for, like staying out of particular areas and so on, uh, things that they must do, things that they must not do. And this is very new territory, which obviously uh, we shall see how all that develops. Um, pathways out, that's really important. The government's announced a uh, a major stream of funding for young women who get involved in gangs, helping them out of that into a life that is going to be successful. And partnership, obviously, very much we're involved in lots of work with um, youth offending teams and the secure estate around gangs, um, understanding the gangs, making sure that there is work on the gangs issue in custody as well as the community. So major programmes. Um, you could do a whole event on that subject alone. But just to give you a flavour, a really crucially important part of our work. And then, um, uh, just before the last uh, point, um, improving the secure estate. The Youth Justice Board took responsibility for the, the secure estate for young people in 2000. And since then, there have been very, very significant improvements. Working with NOMS, because part of our estate is part of the prison service, uh, some of it is run by the private sector secure training centres, uh, and some of it is run by local authorities secure children's homes. The average cost of a uh, place in custody is £79,000 a year. That average um, hides the fact, well, it doesn't conceal it, but it's, um, behind that is a fact that Secure children's homes cost £211,000 a year. Um, that's around £4,000 
uh, a week for every child. Um, and the uh, secure training centres are around 170. So you're talking huge sums of money. Um, and you can see why. It's absolutely mad that we should have children in custody if they don't need to be there, if they could have an appropriate community sentence. And you can understand why we've been so strongly focused on, on that. So, but there is a really important role for us in improving what happens in custody. Uh, there is obviously a, a, a regime of education and training and so on, but we need to do an awful lot more to make sure that everything that happens in custody for a young person is a positive contribution um, and that some of the most terribly damaged young people that we're dealing with get the support that they need in custody. And finally, just on this whole subject of new things coming up, Police and Crime Commission is now this, obviously, it has been very controversial. Um, uh, obviously, we don't have an official view of the YJB about whether it's a good idea or not. That's, that's for the government to decide. But the truth is uh, that if that's going to happen, and it is, and the elections will be in uh, November, then I see it as a real potential opportunity for youth offending teams because, looking at it from my perspective, the role of the uh, Police and Crime Commissioner will not be to run the police force. Obviously, that's the role of the Chief Constable. But the Police and Crime Commissioner will have a strategic role and they will have particularly a role in relation to prevention, community safety and so on. And this is a real opportunity, I think, for what may turn out to be, as we can see, a high-profile role locally, to really get behind the whole prevention issue when it comes to young people. Um, and if we miss this opportunity with the new police and crime commissioners, we'll be missing a trick. So they will be given funds by the Home Office and from other sources, and youth offending teams will need to work very closely with them. So we are now working on that to help youth offending teams absolutely take advantage of that relationship. And I think that's the one really important thing I want to see coming out of police and crime commissioners. So just to sum up, um, there's loads of other things going on too, but I, that's just to give you a flavour. I think the... I think the importance of youth justice can't be, it can't be overstated. And, and it's so important that everything we do, we do in partnership across the whole youth justice system. The model of commissioning across youth justice has been shown to deliver results, but the complacency can never, ever set in. And every single day we see examples of what youth crime does to communities, what it does to the life prospects of the young people involved, and it means we can never really give up on trying harder and harder to make sure we continue to make progress. Thank you. Uh, we just have a, a couple of minutes for questions to Francis, so would you put your hand, thank you very much indeed, and if you could say who you are and where you come from. Certainly, I'm Kay Hammond, and I'm the uh, Cabinet Member for Community Safety at Surrey County Council. And uh, you may be aware, in Surrey, we do particularly well in keeping young people out of custody. But one of the main uh, issues, and I wondered if you could explain what you're doing as a Youth Justice Board, is making, ensuring the confidence of the magistrates who are doing the sentencing to uh, have confidence in, in the teams actually supporting those young people in the community rather than giving custodial sentences. So I wondered if you could just expand on the work with the magistracy, magistracy please. Shall I respond to yes. Yeah. yes, I mean, that is absolutely key. Obviously, in a short presentation, I couldn't really give a flavour, but I, the, the, the thing that's contributed, I would say, most to a you know, quite startling 30% reduction in custody in three years is our relationship with the Magistrates Association. And obviously, individual courts you know, hand down the sentences. But over the, over the last five, six, seven years, we've been working really hard with the Magistrates Association Youth Courts Committee to identify the key factors that make the difference on the sentencing. Because in the end, that court has to feel confident that if they um, commit to a community sentence, and of course, in the youth side, we have intensive supervision and events um, um, uh, programs which which are very intensive compared to adult alter alternatives if the magistrates on that bench are convinced that that is a really robust you know demanding sentence they and very well supervised and if the young person breaches they will be brought back to court then they will they will go for that uh, i've never met i have never yet met and i'm now into my fourth year doing this job a youth court magistrate who actually wants to send a young person to custody so if, you, if the local authority and the yacht and the partnership are doing their job, then we should 
inevitably end up only with those young people where there really cannot be a, a community centre. But there's still a way to go. I think, as you know, um, we know in certain yachts, certain relationships with magistrates are very successful. Others, still not there. Uh, but the imminent transfer of funds to pay for the cost of custody will focus attention very, very strongly. Because if authorities are not focused on that, they're going to get a very big bill, which currently is not on their budget book. And, and I think that will, for those who are not trying hard enough, that will make a big difference, I think. Okay, thank you very much. There's a gentleman right at the back, Jay. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Abdul. Hi, I'm a councillor, London Borough of Camden, and a cabinet member for community safety. Firstly, I just want to um, make a brief comment around sort of, you mentioned about families, and I think it's really important that uh, uh, um, we do focus around uh, our work around families and uh, making that sort of early intervention. My question is around uh, um, when, when young people reach 18 plus, where is that sort of continuity? Because once they go past the youth offending team, they refer to someone else, and that sort of, that, that kind of pro proactive work is in some ways lost. And my second question is, um, I haven't seen the rights last year, and most, most of the young people who were involved uh, were, had convictions. So what can we learn from, from, from the rights itself? Uh, um, uh, Baroness Harris is just going to repeat that. I apologise, but I'm no. very deaf, so I, I just can't quite catch that properly. So Baroness Harris is going to repeat the question for me. It, it, it mm. was about families and what... It's a I think, I think it's really important that we, we do work with families and, and then it's about making the early intervention. Because if you look at a lot of the um, young people that go through the criminal justice system itself, whether they come from broken families, yes. you know, there's been kind of, uh, you know... Uh, and, you know, and the, you, your question was around families and what the criminal justice system can do to help? That, more or less along more that or line, but it's also the, the second question is around sort of youth fending team that they work towards sort of 18 plus. So yes. what happens after 18? Okay. After 18, yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, in terms of, I mean, the fam family um, aspect of it, I mean, I totally agree. I mean, the issues for, the, 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 the reason young people are, offending, um, either my, in a minor way or seriously, is because they haven't had, you know, generally speaking, the sort of support and um, effort put into their upbringing and, and the kind of um, opportunities which enable them to go and do something positive rather than something negative. So, so a family intervention, family support is absolutely crucial. And I think, I think what's probably I find most encouraging over the last 10 years is that, that the local authorities and their partners, I, I think, almost universally have kind of got that. Actually, doing something about it effectively long term is, is quite a challenge because it involves quite expensive effort. Having said that, we do know a lot of resource goes into certain families when, which is overlapping, duplicated, and not necessarily the most efficient way of doing things. But I think, so I think the Troubled Families Initiative is quite an important program. It's a very important program, but I think it will be a long-term program. This is not a quick fix at all. In the youth justice system, where we're talking about the more, most serious end, really, of young people's behaviour, um, there is a very strong focus on, uh, in, in many areas, on multi-systemic therapy, which is a very intensive family support proven um, success full scheme which comes from America and where it has to be replicated exactly um, in order to produce the results. Expensive but nevertheless as part of our pathfinders for reducing the use of custody there are several of the pathfinders are using uh, MST as, as part of their, their work. So I think there's a total recognition. We also have a, a sentence called intensive fostering which is available in some areas which involves intensive work with young people where the young person is taken from the family actually and work with very very intensively but maintains their family connections with a view to them being reintroduced to the family in a, in a managed way so that they can finally lead successful lives. So the, uh, totally we accept that really. In terms of um, the transition at 18, it's absolutely crucial and there's a lot of good work goes on. It's not as if, you know, at 18 young people are just sort of thrown into the adult system. In many areas there are very good uh, arrangements but the difference between the support a young person gets and supervision under 18 and over 18 is phenomenal. And we see young people who are 
18, but they are not 18. They are so immature, they are so vulnerable that they should not be, in any, just in a sense, let, put into the adult system. So what we have to do is, I don't think it's about structural change or anything like that, it's about finding ways of recognising between ourselves and probation um, which young people really shouldn't be treated like that, but which can be safely. Um, and this is about interests of communities and victims as well as the young person themselves. But, but you, if I, you talk to a governor in a young offender institution, they will tell you how concerned they are sometimes that actually having to hand over a young person aged 18, we keep them for quite a while at 18 anyway, often until they're 19, um, but then they have to go into the adult estate. And it's not a criticism of the adult or young offender prison over 18, that they haven't got the resource or the, or the kind of capacity to handle a very vulnerable young person at that point. So we've got to get, I think as we all improve, we've got to get more sophisticated about what we do at that stage. So I'm a bit passionate about that. So, and at the moment, we're, we're working with NOMS and all the departments to try and come up with a way of thinking about that. So it's all in development really at the moment.